On the day of my wedding, my fiancé rushed to take care of her benefactor senior brothers, the orphan brother left behind, leaving me to become the laughingstock. The wedding was called off. My parents were furious, and everyone ridiculed me. She said, we can always marry again, but I must repay this debt of gratitude. After hearing her words, I gave her a thumbs up. Well, you're kind, you're noble, and the world should take you as an example. I think we shouldn't marry after all. You may want to raise someone else's child without blood ties, but I don't. Chapter 1. At the wedding venue, my fiancé suddenly changed out of her wedding dress and left through the main door in casual clothes. I was completely dumbfounded. The wedding march was still playing, and the host's words came to an abrupt stop. The girl, in her twenties, hadn't been in the industry long and had never seen anything like this, an actual runaway bride, like something out of a drama. She froze in place. Frozen alongside her were my parents. Guests began whispering among themselves, and my father, unsteady on his feet, rushed up to the platform, grabbed my arm, and asked, what's going on, son, everything was going smoothly, and now the bride's gone, you should call Monica right away and find out what's happening, today is your wedding, everyone is waiting, this isn't a joke, my father's voice snapped me out of my daze, meeting his anxious gaze, I quickly came to my senses, right, the phone. The strange behavior of my fiancé started right after she received that call in the dressing room. I was curious who had called her and who was important enough for her to abandon our wedding, making me a laughingstock in front of everyone. Chapter 2 Monica had been my girlfriend for three years and was also my junior at university. I was the head of the campus media center, in charge of all hosting events on and off campus. We first crossed paths during the National Day celebration in my junior year, where we co-hosted the event. Monica was beautiful with a sweet voice, and was one of the standouts in the hosting team. I was the one who pursued her. In my upbringing, when you meet something or someone you desire, you should boldly go after it. Love is no exception. Because of Monica, my image at school underwent a dramatic change. From being the cool guy, I became known as the campus simp. I never missed an opportunity to appear at any event Monica was at, always attending to her needs. Thankfully, my efforts paid off. After six months, I finally won Monica over. The day I confessed. She teared up and told me she was soft-hearted and couldn't refuse sincerity. In hindsight, being soft-hearted is indeed a sin. Monica, who had left the wedding without a word, showed up the day after the wedding with boy at my doorstep. I thought she had come to officially break off the engagement and make a public statement. But her first words were of complaint. Simon, this is my senior brother's younger brother. Duncan, he was in a car accident yesterday. He grew up relying solely on his brother. And I couldn't just leave him alone. We can marry again. But if something happens to him, how could I face my deceased senior brother? You're such a good person. You understand, right? Chapter 3. Martin was Monica's senior at university. The same, senior brother, she always mentioned. I've never met him in person, but I've heard plenty of rumors about him. Kind, upright, and always thoughtful in his actions. Monica had told me many times about how much she owed him. Knowing she was financially struggling, he helped her apply for scholarships, took her to various hosting events to earn extra money, encouraged her, praised her and helped transform her from a shy and introverted person into someone confident and poised. From the stories, I could understand why Monica felt indebted to him. But right now, I couldn't accept Monica's explanation. I'm a good person, so I'm supposed to understand her vanishing from the wedding without a reason. Honestly, in my understanding, good person isn't really a compliment. It's equivalent to words like pushover or fool. The boy she brought with her was about 20 years old, with sharp features that would appeal to most girls. He stared directly at me without a hint of guilt for disrupting my wedding. What he said didn't sound like an apology. It felt more like a boast. Simon, it was me who called Monica yesterday. I had a pretty bad car accident. And since I didn't have any relatives in this city, I panicked and called Monica. I was so confused. I completely forgot she was getting married. I bit back my irritation and studied the boy in front of me carefully before asking a genuine question. A pretty bad car accident. You seem to be walking fine. No injuries on your face or body. Where exactly are you hurt? No hospital. No checkup. I asked calmly, but Monica's reaction was anything but. She immediately stepped forward, standing protectively in front of the boy. Simon, I'm explaining things to you. Can you stay rational? Why are you questioning a kid like this? I've already told you. We can reschedule the wedding. You can't nitpick over such a small thing. I was so infuriated by her words that I laughed, my tone turning cold. Nitpicking. Monica. You're the one who disappeared from the wedding. A whole room full of people came just to witness this disaster. I don't care if I lose face, but what about my parents? People are laughing at me. Ten grand for the venue and setup. Eight grand per table for the food. And none of it could keep you, the bride, in the room. Now everyone thinks that our marriage lacks affection. And you think we can just redo the wedding. 
Will your family be the ones paying for it? In the years I'd been with Monica, I'd hardly ever spoken harshly to her, but this time, I couldn't hold back. Monica came from a single parent family, with a bedridden mother who couldn't even attend the wedding. Her entire income went towards her mother's medical bills, leaving her perpetually strapped for cash. I knew all of this, and because I felt sorry for her, I'd never let her bear any financial burden. I come from a well off family, I have a good job, and my parents are in good health. Before the wedding, I had an honest discussion with my parents about Monica's situation. We decided that my family would cover all the wedding expenses, and her family wouldn't need to provide a dowry. Being an only child, my parents didn't want to shortchange me or my future wife. They bought us a house, a car, and gave us a dowry of 188,000 yuan, all so that I could marry Monica in a grand and respectable way. But the fiasco at the wedding humiliated my parents. My father had to take heart medication just to keep himself calm. He's a reasonable man and didn't blame anyone without knowing the full story. He simply advised me to find out what had happened and ask my wife to make a public statement so that no one would misunderstand and damage our marriage. I hadn't expected Monica's attitude to be even worse than I'd imagined. When I mentioned the money, it was like she turned into a different person. She glared at me with undisguised contempt and spat her words out venomously. Simon, just because your family has some money, do you need to bring it up every chance you get? You only care about your parents losing face, but what about mine? Didn't I tell you about senior brother Martin? He helped me so much to get where I am today. How could I not repay this debt of gratitude and ignore his brother's plight? Duncan has had it hard enough already. Don't you have any compassion? By this point, I had run out of patience. I glanced at the smug-looking boy standing beside her. I gave her a thumbs up. Well, you're kind, you're noble, and the world should take you as an example. As for the wedding, I think we shouldn't go through with it. You may want to raise someone else's child with no blood ties, but I don't. Chapter 4 the conversation fell apart, and Monica left in a fury, saying, you'll regret this, as she stormed off with the boy, a friend, who was overseas, somehow got wind of the fiasco at my wedding and called to check in, during our conversation, he dropped a bombshell on me, dude, I never liked your girlfriend, I told you before that she was using you as a stepping stone, but you wouldn't listen, well, look at what happened, didn't I call it, if she's so focused on repaying some favor, why would she be getting married, Monica's so-called beneficiary, Martin, wasn't just her senior brother, he was also her former crush, you know how dangerous those dead and gone in their prime figures can be, right, and Duncan looks just like his brother, this is straight out of some tragic drama, don't take this the wrong way, but even if you go through with the wedding again, I bet you'll end up in the same mess, his words hit me like a bucket of cold water, no wonder Monica acted so protective of that boy yesterday, like a mother hen guarding her chick, it turns out she's treating him like a stand-in for her long lost love, I'd heard about Martin from others, Mostly that he was Monica's senior brother and had co-hosted many events with her, helping her land gigs and opportunities. Monica never shied away from mentioning his name in front of me, always speaking about how sorry she was for his early death and how grateful she was for the help he'd given her. But I had no idea there was this hidden backstory waiting for me. I felt a chill run through me as I turned to look at Monica's post on her social media. It was a picture of her with Duncan. The caption seemed like it was written just for me. Since I was young. My mom taught me to always repay kindness. I promised myself that one day I'd find someone with a heart full of gratitude and make them my partner. If I can't find that person, I won't marry. I couldn't help but laugh at the irony. Even at this point, she's still sticking to that narrative of repaying favors. If she wants to repay so badly, then I'll let her repay to her heart's content. Chapter 5 I reached out to one of my university professors to get more information about Martin's family situation. It wasn't too different from what Monica had told me. Their family was indeed struggling. But the poor, helpless younger brother that Monica spoke of wasn't as innocent as she made him out to be. The professor's description was alarming. Simon, why are you asking about him? Let me tell you, stay out of his family's affairs. Martin was a good kid, but his younger brother is nothing but trouble. He dropped out of high school and started hanging out with the lowlifes from South Alley. He's either fighting, gambling, or worse, soliciting prostitutes. He only shows up to ask his brother for money. Word has it that the debt collectors are banging on his door now. He even wrecked a car recently. If you see him, keep your distance. You don't want to get dragged into his mess. Debt collectors. A car accident. I felt a knot tighten in my chest. Why did this all sound so familiar? The funny thing is, the car Monica drove away from the wedding in was mine. When I got back to the apartment, I went straight to the underground garage, intending to pull the dashcam footage and see for myself this serious car accident Duncan was talking about. And wouldn't you know it. I ran right into Monica and Duncan, loaded down with bags of groceries. As they were heading upstairs, my mind went blank for a couple of seconds. Monica tilted her chin at me, speaking in a proud tone. Simon, 
Duncan's such a good kid, he feels bad for causing issues between us. So he went out and bought all this stuff to make it up. I've thought it over too. What happened at the wedding was my fault. Don't be mad. Let's have dinner and talk it out. Seeing that I didn't respond, Monica grabbed my arm, pouting and playing coy. Honey, you know me. I just have a bit of a temper. Whatever I said back then, I didn't mean it. We've been together for three years. How can we just call off the wedding like that? There were reasons for what happened at the wedding. Duncan and I are both willing to sincerely apologize. Please, be the bigger person and let this go. We still have a future together. Just as I was about to respond with a retort, I caught a glimpse of the fleeting irritation on Duncan's face. I immediately shifted my words. Let's go upstairs first. Duncan, eager to please, rushed over and grabbed the bag out of my hand. Brother-in-law, you and sis go on ahead. I'll take care of these things. Monica reached out to pat his head, looking smug. See, didn't I tell you Duncan's such a good kid? He's so obedient. If it weren't for the two of them standing right there, I swear I would have thrown up. Watching them walk ahead, southwest cozy and close, I curled my lip in a bitter smile. Tattoos, piercings, reeking of smoke and alcohol, and he's a good kid. If this kid ends up betraying her, I sure hope she doesn't come crying to me. Chapter 6 I had no appetite for dinner that night. From preparing the food to washing the dishes, I barely spoke and didn't offer any help. The reason, before we entered the apartment, Duncan had proudly claimed that he'd been through tough times and could handle anything. So, I casually said, well, then why don't you take care of preparing dinner and washing the dishes tonight, and promptly assigned him to the kitchen. He couldn't come to my house and leave without doing something. Right. Monica shot me a disapproving look. Simon, seriously, who asks a guest to cook? He's just a kid. What can he do? Duncan's face stiffened at my words, but after hearing Monica, he quickly changed his expression and started comforting her. Oh, it's no big deal, sis. Ever since my brother passed, I've had a rough time. I've had to cook and take care of the house myself. Maybe Simon can't cook just wants to try my cooking. Don't worry, sis. I'm good at taking care of things. I didn't respond. Just glanced at Monica with a cold look. Her expression turned slightly awkward. Clearly. Duncan didn't know me well enough. He had no idea how I earned the title of simp back in the day. I had cherished Monica so much that I ignored the burdens her family placed on me and overlooked her indifference toward me. I never let her lift a finger around the house. After we moved in together, I handled all the cooking, while Monica spent her evenings lounging on the couch, shopping online or binge-watching shows, waiting for dinner to be served. Duncan's attempt to stir things up was misguided. Seeing that neither Monica nor I responded to his words, he sheepishly slinked into the kitchen. I had planned to have a serious talk with Monica, but before I could get a word out, she couldn't bear to see Duncan alone in the kitchen. She got up and went to help him. I stared at her warmly engaged back, and for a moment, I was lost in thought. That kind of thoughtfulness, I'd never received it. Even when I had a high fever of 39 degrees and was still worried about preparing food, Monica would simply lie in bed and offer a half-hearted, thanks, you're working hard, as if it were just a formality. And now, here she was, someone who'd never so much as sliced a piece of fruit, volunteering to make a dish as complicated. At that moment, I suddenly had a clear realization. Monica and I were completely finished. Looking back over the past three years of our relationship, was she really with me out of love? No, she stayed with me for many reasons, money, care, tolerance, but love, that was never part of the equation. Chapter 7 The dinner ended without much fanfare, but the strange atmosphere between the three of us didn't dissipate even after the meal was over. The clock on the wall pointed to 9 p.m. But Duncan, after washing the dishes, showed no signs of leaving. He sat beside Monica, obediently peeling fruit for her. Monica glanced at me cautiously several times before speaking. Simon, look at how considerate Duncan is. Doesn't he remind you of Leo? Leo was my cousin, who had never liked Monica. When he found out I was going to marry her, he was so upset that he didn't even attend the wedding. I was surprised that Monica would mention him so out of the blue. But the reason quickly became clear. Didn't you say the other day that you're short on an assistant? Duncan's smart and reliable, so why not let him work at your company? And since he's had some trouble recently and can't stay at his old place, our guest room is free, he could live here, and you two could carpool to work, it'd be convenient. I was stunned by Monica's suggestion and stayed silent for a long time, processing what she had just said. When I finally spoke, my voice was cold and devoid of emotion. Did you see the job posting I put up? Bachelor's degree, two years of work experience. Proficiency in Excel and PowerPoint, does he meet those requirements? If he does, fine, bring his documents, and he can come for an interview tomorrow. Don't talk about arranging anything. I still have to consider what's best for the company. Even if he meets the qualifications, he'll need to go through three rounds of interviews with HR. If he passes, then we'll talk. 
My words left both Monica and Duncan speechless. Duncan forced a smile and tugged at Monica's sleeve. Sis, if Simon doesn't want to, it's okay. Don't push him because of me. My brother used to say that heroes aren't judged by their background. Sure, I don't have a high education, but no matter where I work, I'll put in the effort. With that, he pretended to wipe away non-existent tears. Seeing his act, Monica's expression changed, and she angrily lashed out at me. Simon, how did I not realize before that you're such a materialistic person? All you ever talk about is education. Money, do you even care about how other people feel? Duncan may not have much formal education, but he's honest and hardworking. Why wouldn't he be a good fit as your assistant? Why does the company need all these rigid qualifications? You're looking down on him like some lowly dog. I let out a bitter laugh, refusing to back down. Education and money aren't important. Then how did you get your current job? Could you have gotten it without either? Monica fell silent, at a loss for words. I had reached the end of my patience and decided to end it once and for all. Please take your benefactor's brother and leave. Go repay your debt wherever you want. Just don't bother me anymore. The guest room. That's for actual guests. I don't know him. And we're not family. And let me make myself perfectly clear. We're done. I'm not joking. The car is mine. The house is mine. If you want to take your things, do so. Leave the car keys. And I'll change the door lock code. Monica. Let's not see each other again unless absolutely necessary. Chapter 8. Monica was stunned by my response. It seemed that only now she realized I wasn't joking when I said we wouldn't be getting married. But she was too proud to admit defeat in front of Duncan. So, with him in tow, she stormed out. Not even 30 minutes after she left, I received a notification on my bank account. Your XX bank account was charged 899 yuan on August 17, 2024. At the same time, my membership account at a certain five-star hotel gained 899 points. I was speechless. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. She acted tough, but when it came to spending money, she didn't hesitate. Even after everything that had happened, she was still using my money to book a room at a five-star hotel for someone else. Incredible. I immediately cancelled the family card and called the bank to freeze the credit card I had given to Monica. After sorting all that out, I called my parents to tell them what had happened between Monica and me. My dad was furious but relieved that we had held the wedding before officially registering the marriage. During the conversation with my parents, I also learned that Monica's mother had been privately pressuring my family to hand over the dowry. Luckily, my mom had insisted that we wait until after the wedding and marriage registration to give it to them. Now that the wedding was off, at least we hadn't lost the dowry money. I thought that would be the end of it. But when I arrived at the office on Monday, I was met with a sight that caught me completely off guard. Monica was standing in the lobby, red-eyed and looking exhausted, with her supposedly bedridden mother by her side. The moment I saw the old woman, I realized I had been deceived. The woman who could gather a mob to cause a scene at my company's front door was definitely not as sick as Monica had led me to believe. To prevent any drama or staged accidents, I immediately ordered the media team to grab their cameras and record everything from every possible angle. Within minutes, Monica's mother and the crowd she'd brought with her were completely surrounded by cameras. Looking dumbfounded, standing at the center, I signaled them to continue their performance. Don't stop now. If you're going to make a scene, do it right. I need this footage for the media. Louder. Don't be shy. Chapter 9. It was clear they had never dealt with the media. Surrounded by all the cameras and equipment, everyone started to panic. Monica's mother's arm was being tugged back and forth by the people around her. Monica's mom. You said we were just here to hold a banner for you. To give you some courage. You didn't mention all these cameras. I didn't tell my family about this. How embarrassing would it be if they saw me acting like this on TV? Aren't you his mother-in-law? Doesn't he listen to you? Tell him to stop filming. This is making me uncomfortable. Old lady. With this setup. We're going to need more money. Not much, but at least another hundred each. I can tell your son-in-law has money. Just don't make it too hard on him. Think long term. Hearing the complaints from the crowd, Monica started to get flustered. She nervously tried to calm her mother. Mom, I told you. Simon isn't the kind of person who responds well to threats. This won't work. It'd be better if you just pretended to be sick and I acted all sweet. That would work much better. I watched the mother and daughter coldly, silently observing their performance. Out of nowhere, Duncan barged into the scene disrupting the tense silence caused by the cameras. I'm not sure if he's been watching too many cartoons, but he seemed to think it was his moment to play the hero. Duncan rushed in front of Monica and her mother, and in one swift motion, grabbed the nearest camera and slammed it onto the ground. The loud crash left everyone stunned. The smarter ones in the crowd realized it was time to leave and slipped away quietly. Monica's expression of gratitude toward Duncan was quickly shattered by my cold and emotionless words. Great job. Duncan, I was just wondering how I could call the police since the damage was under 3,000 yuan. For your information, that was a 24K HD camera, 
Market price 23,000 yuan. Who's going to pay for it? You all better figure that out in advance. As soon as I finished speaking, the crowd dispersed like scared animals, terrified of being stuck with the bill. Monica's mother turned pale, but she still tried to hold her ground. You. You can't scare me with your money talk. You've been dating my daughter for three years, wasting her youth. Now, just because she wants to repay a favor, you turn your back on her. I know you work in the media, but let me tell you, justice will prevail. If you don't give me the dowry you promised, I'll bring people to make trouble for you every day and expose your scumbag behavior. Her words made me laugh. I shrugged. This isn't the place for a, justice will prevail, speech. Ma'am. All right then. Let me be direct. Go ahead and expose me. I'd love to see how you prove I'm a scumbag, by talking about your daughter running away from the wedding, or maybe about her cheating. Don't look at me like that. Do you think I'm lying? I've got footage on my dashcam showing your daughter's indecent behavior. Do you want to hear it? I can play it for you if you'd like. Chapter 10. The moment I mentioned the dashcam, Monica and Duncan's faces turned all sorts of colors. Monica lost control and shouted at me, Simon. I've been with you for three years, and I never thought you'd be so despicable. If you dare expose my privacy, I'll make your life miserable. That, that night, Duncan and I just drank too much, and things got out of hand. That little bit of audio doesn't prove anything. And you, wasting three years of my life, now you want to call off the wedding just like that. Where's your sense of responsibility? You run a company, but you're disgusting. Any lingering affection I had for her had long since disappeared, and her hysterical, irrational words had no effect on me anymore. Watching her unravel before me, I felt only pity and sadness. I looked at her coldly and responded without emotion. Monica, you graduated from one of the top universities. You should know better than to bring the law into this. Let me put it simply, don't you realize your mother's actions today amount to causing a public disturbance, and your dear brother smashing that camera? That counts as criminal damage. Instead of wasting time here with nonsense, why don't you think about my question? Who's going to pay for that 23,000 yuan camera? If you care so much about your senior brother's favor, I'm sure you'll be more than happy to cover the costs for his dear little brother, right? At that moment, Duncan lived up to his reputation, playing his part perfectly. He clung to Monica's arm, pleading for help. Sis, I only smashed the camera to protect you. You know my situation. I can't afford to pay for something that expensive. You have to remember how much your brother helped me. He'd be furious if I had to suffer like this after everything. Monica hadn't even had a chance to respond when her mother snapped. She pulled Monica away and slapped Duncan across the face. The loud smack echoed through the hall, followed by her furious yelling. You little brat. If it weren't for you, my daughter wouldn't be in this mess. You're broken uneducated. How did you even dare to get involved with Monica? Because of you, I've lost the dowry. And now you want my daughter to cover for you. Are you even a man? And what kind of delusional dreams are you living in? If my daughter ever ends up with a loser like you, I'll break her legs myself. I could see the shift in Duncan's eyes, and I quickly signaled my team to step back. The police, who had just arrived, noticed something was wrong with Duncan too and rushed in to intervene, but it was too late. Duncan pulled a knife from who knows where and stabbed it deep into the old woman's chest. As he stabbed her, he cursed violently. You damn old hag. Who do you think you are, talking down to me like that? You think I'm soft? You think your daughter is some pure angel, she's been sleeping with me behind your back, even though she has a fiancé, you think she's repaying a favor, she's just into my face because I look like my brother. Well, I'm already buried in debt, I can't pay 23,000 yuan, so why don't we just die together, we'll go see my brother in hell. Monica screamed and shut her eyes at the horrifying sight, the police tackled Duncan quickly and restrained him, while paramedics rushed in to take Monica's mother to the hospital, as Monica, looking broken and terrified, was led away by the police. She reached out helplessly, just like on all those nights when she was afraid of the dark. She reached out to me for help. Simon, I'm so scared. Can you help me? I didn't know Duncan was like this. I know I was wrong. I'm really scared. I gave her a contemptuous smile. Now you're scared. It's too late. Monica, I'm scared too. You're the kind of person who terrifies me. Chapter 11. Witnessing a murder firsthand, it's impossible to say it didn't affect me at all. But knowing Duncan's nature as a societal parasite, I had a certain psychological expectation for his behavior. It's ironic. Really, Mrs. Song, who had maintained her image of being frail for years, now had it come true. She was stabbed three times in the abdomen, all life-threatening, and is now in a vegetative state, kept alive only by four fluids. Monica's salary of over 4,000 yuan a month clearly won't be enough to support her. When I heard that Monica resigned from her job at a friend's company, I wasn't surprised. She had always been someone who cared deeply about saving face. The impact of the assault case was significant, and the media coverage didn't blur her identity enough. Everywhere she goes now, 
People gossip, especially since she worked at a company owned by her ex-fiancé's friend. Knowing I would never forgive her, she hasn't appeared in front of me again. She only sent a letter through a mutual friend, claiming it was to express her apology. I didn't even bother reading the letter and told my friend to deal with it however he saw fit. Adding one simple reply. This isn't the time to write apology letters. I get dizzy reading. I don't care for them. I know very well that I sincerely loved Monica once. I gave her endless kindness and tolerance. In this melodrama, disguised as repaying a favor, I gave her many chances. Even at the beginning, I reminded her multiple times that even if she wanted to repay a favor, she should first check if the person truly deserved it. She never listened. Instead, she constantly accused me of being narrow-minded and not kind enough. Was I truly not kind? If I had really been unkind, this whole conflict would have exploded the night I got the dashcam footage. I should have exposed this entire farce at the wedding, but I thought of her, the girl I had truly loved, preserving the last shred of dignity for her as a woman, while completely removing her from my life, was the best solution I could think of. I remember, during the first year of our relationship, Monica asked me a question. If one day she made a mistake so outrageous, so irredeemable, what would I do? At the time, I answered that I would keep the last bit of beauty intact and let her disappear completely from my world. I kept my word, the one who should feel regret is not me. The next time I encountered Monica was four years later. I was out shopping at the mall with my wife when a clumsy saleswoman bumped into me. I quickly reached out to steady her and asked cautiously, are you okay? The haggard woman raised her head, her expression a mix of shock and panic. My wife, who had her arm looped through mine, leaned in and asked curiously, what's wrong? Honey, do you know her? The woman in front of me stumbled and hurried away. I smiled faintly and tightened my grip on my wife's hand. I responded gently, no. I think she mistook me for someone else. Come on, let's go buy something for the baby.